Hey there. So we're live. I don't know if David does that to me, but you know, when we get on, it's like we're automatically live and now we're people, there. Okay. Are, people are joining. So I see. I see. So we, we can't to... talk about, about salacious things. <laughs> well, we could. <laughs> Um, okay, so hi everybody. Like always, as you're joining, go ahead and open the chat box and let us know who you are, what organization you're chatting in from, and where in the world you are right now. And we will get started in about a little less than 10 minutes. All right. Okay. Yes, it's funny. The other day on our webinar, do we have to start the broadcast before it starts? Um, I don't know why this one got set. I don't remember if we jump in. Hi, Sophie from Missouri State. Nice to see you. Maria from Vancouver Island, Canada. Children's Sophie. Health. Yep. And uh, yep, Sophie, nice to see you. All right, so as people filter in, we will just uh, hang around. But it is a beautiful day. Did you? It's beautiful here on the Northeast Coast. Did you get outside today? No, you're just looking out the window? <laughs> I haven't been out yet. I'll go out for a walk later. <laughs> you must, you must. All right, folks, as you're joining us, do let us know. Oh, and if you would, of course, as always, try and remember to hit that blue panel in the chat box before you send us a message so that you're sending messages to all panelists and attendees so that everybody can see who's here. And as you're joining us, if you could just um, let us know who you are, what organization you are calling from, and where in the world you are. Okay, how is it in Missouri today, Sophie? And Maria on Vancouver Island, how's the weather there? Hi, Susan, nice to see you. Phoenix, Arizona, I'm imagining it's sunny there. Yes, a beautiful day in Springfield, Missouri, good. Oh, Phoenix Island is one of the beautiful places in this world. You ever been there, Amy? Yes, yes, once to take a, an Alaskan cruise. Right. Uh, we left from Vancouver, I think. Is it not? Is it the same as Vancouver Island? I'm not sure. Is Vancouver the same as Vancouver? No, no Vancouver is a city. Ah, then I've Vancouver not been. Vancouver Island is an island. Ah, no, I have island, not been then. I have it, not it, been, I think. Um, oh, Stacy from Elijah's Promise. Nice to see you. I'm happy you're here. Uh, Rosalind from. St. Andrew's Episcopal School. So I went to a high school in Maryland, uh, St. Andrew's Episcopal School. And I, my rabbi joked, we called it St. Andrew's Episcopal School for Jewish girls. <laughs> yes, I did. So, and there were several of us there that just sat in the back of services and sort of twiddled our thumbs and were probably mostly respectful. That's uh, so anyways, I did indeed, yes. Uh, so let's see who else is joining us. Karen from Madison and Rosalind. I, I hope yeah. that's not a horrifying story. Um, oh, and just for a little bit of other fodder, that St. Andrew's Episcopal School where I went, that is the school that Baron Trump now goes to. Oh and my goodness. We won't, I won't comment on that. No comments. No, no we, there. No comments. We try to stay away from that. Oh, Velvet from Giant Steps. Hi there, Velvet. Yes. All right. Let's Thanks see. Calls. And we have Rick from the North Coast Repertory Theater in Solan Solana Beach, California. I've been thinking so much about live performing arts organizations and musical organizations over the last day or two, thinking that if I were running a theater or a, or a performing arts organization, which I'm not, but mm -hmm. if I were, mm -hmm. what I would do is I would have my, my performers, my 
mimes and actors and musicians be performing in every public place just informally that I could find in mm. parks and town squares and farmers markets so that wherever anyone went they were moving to the same rhythm and beat and laughing to the same thing so everyone's social distancing yes but, excellent but live in a time when people are so distrusting of one another right because you don't know if somebody's had the disease or hasn't had the disease and, and somehow the arts if they were much more embedded in the public spaces i think could help mitigate that yes yes good point we've got martha all the way from uganda east africa yes. wonderful welcome what time is it there martha i'm afraid it might be in the middle of the night Let's see, Candace from Santa Monica, Santa Monica, I can't speak today. Katie from Cedar Rapids. Cat adoptions in Las Vegas. And Andrea, we have Velvet from Giant Steps with yes. us today. No, I saw that. Yes, and uh, good. Well, welcome everybody. We've got three or four more minutes before we officially get started, but do- Ija in India, it's midnight, it's 12.30. Oh my goodness, I hope you're drinking some strong tea. <laughs> yes. yes, welcome. Thank you for joining us. 10 in the morning in Uganda. Oh, not bad at all. No so bad, but midnight, that takes some courage. Some, oh, some 10, no, 10 p.m., she says yeah. in Uganda. Uh -huh. 10 uh, okay. p.m. but still not too bad still. not uh, from boston charlene uh, from sunny colorado yes if you're just joining us let us know uh where you're calling in from what organization you're with okay. the great state of brooklyn hi marjorie in the great state of brooklyn this is andrea in the great state of the bronx <laughs> Yes, all right, and Amy from Austin, Texas, and Beth from the JCC of Greater Vancouver. I was just getting a lesson in geography from Vancouver, about Vancouver earlier. Uh, let's see. There's the most wonderful garden in the, on Vancouver Island. I can't remember mm. the name of it now. Hmm. I bet we'll be- Butchart, sure. that's it, that's right, Butchart <laughs> Garden. Exactly, exactly, yeah. I've been there, so beautiful. All right, Frank from Fairbanks, Alaska, welcome. Excellent. And Melissa from Philadelphia, hi, Frank Melissa. From Minnesota, it looked like, I think. It scrolled past so fast. Uh, all right, excellent, welcome. Let us know where you're calling in from and what organization. And you know what? I see a lot of people, some people are sending it to all attendees just so everybody can see because it's interesting. Um, but do go ahead and drop down your the blue panel in the chat box so that it's not just to us panelists so that you're saying hello to everybody on the call as well. And uh, it's just about the top of the hour. So we will get uh, started. Oh, somebody from University of Waterloo is here. Steph from the University of Waterloo, Andrea. Hi, Steph. Yeah. And, uh, Amy from the School of Advanced Research in Santa Fe. Hi there. Yep. I know your organization. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So we've got what looks like a good crowd. Everybody's joining. So listen, uh, let's see. I want to give people one more minute before I introduce you, Andrea. Although uh, from the comments, it looks like you need no introduction. So, <laughs> um, but I will introduce you anyways, because I don't think that you have been on one of my calls in a long time, actually. Oh, I haven't. That's well, right. you know, these calls, I shouldn't say a long time. These calls have only been going on for eight weeks, of course, but you know, you've been in my videos, but that was probably two or three years ago or more. Yeah, maybe yeah. more. Frank from Fairbanks, Alaska, that's way up there. Mm -hmm. Fairbanks, Alaska, holy moly. That's, okay. that's also a big difference, time zone difference. What are you, four or five hours from the East Coast? Something like that, it's far. Always amazes me how big Alaska is. Yeah, Susan, is it only eight weeks that we've been in this? Maybe it's the ninth week of this. Um, I was saying yesterday that I, I know exactly how long COVID has been because the schools got shut down on March 13th, uh, which I think I said last week was my 45th birthday. So I, that will be forever in my brain that COVID started 
um, my, my kids' schools officially shut down on my 45th birthday. So I know that for sure. Um, I believe I, I, I think I just let your 45th birthday go right by. Oh, no, I'm sure. We, <laughs> I'm sure we discussed it. Well, you know what? It's because it was total chaos. Everything was shutting down and it was... Anyways, all right. Oh, a wonderful gift. I wonder how many other women in this group would say that. That's what Rick, Rick is saying. <laughs> the, oh, that it's a gift? A Where? wonderful gift to have children at home. <laughs> home. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what a gift. Um, <laughs> all right. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. We're two minutes into the hour, so I don't want to delay anymore, but it's super nice that we are um, having everybody join us now. Yes, every day feels like Groundhog's Day, Amy. It is true. Um, oh, and we've got another, uh, let's India, see. India, where it's midnight. Yes, yes. Um, all right, welcome everybody. Listen, let's get offici officially go ahead and get started. Of course, I'm Amy Eisenstein. I'm thrilled to, to see you all here and have you joining us um, as always. If you have a specific question that you want either one of us to answer, please do go ahead and open up the Q&A box that's on your control panel because we don't want to miss it in the chat as it goes by so quickly. Um, if you want to share resources, share your opinion, thoughts, anything like that, please do go ahead and share it in the the uh, chat box and make sure that you are sending it not just to the panelists, but to all panelists and attendees so everybody can see it. So go ahead and drop down that box, all panelists and attendees so that it goes to everybody. All right, I'm so happy. Uh, if you're just joining us, do feel free to go ahead and put in the chat box where you're calling in from and what organization you're calling from. So we're not gonna use the raised hand function. Uh, somebody turned it on and then just turned it off. Um, we will stick with the Q&A box for today like we always do. So it is my absolute pleasure to have my uh, colleague, part business partner, co-founder of the Capital Campaign Toolkit, and um, I am thrilled to say a close, close friend now, my, my colleague Andrea Kilstead here to join us today. And the reason that I've joined Andrea, many of you may, may already know that we do these town hall talks for the Capital Campaign Toolkit every Monday at two o'clock, which you're welcome to join. They are, as you would imagine, predominantly Capital Campaign focused. And of course, um, these calls on Thursdays are more general fundraising focused. But the reason that I asked Andrea to join us today is because she is one of the most brilliant people I have ever met at visioning and thinking about the future and big picture and grand ideas, which makes her a genius when it comes to capital campaigns because she can see your organization 10 years into the future. Sometimes even when you or your board members can't see, have this vision. And right now, we absolutely, absolutely need to think about how do our organizations look six months from now, 12 months from now, 18 months from now. So I have invited Andrea to help us have a conversation, think through planning, visioning, modeling um, for the future of your organization because we feel so strongly that's what you need to be doing right now. And, and even more importantly, how to engage your biggest supporters, your donors, your community leaders in this visioning process so that they're with you in lockstep every step of the way. Um, but before we get to do that, and I'm gonna let her you know, talk for a few minutes about how she will help you think about how to prepare for the future and, and plan to, to see what your organization, how it will reshape and, and look like six months from now, a year from now. Um, I want to tell you that if you're unfamiliar with Andrea, she is the... I'm going to say grandmother of capital campaigns, <laughs> if that's okay. I think she lets me say that. Um, 
she has written so many, published so many books, but the one that stands out is her strategies. What's it called, Andrea? Oh, shoot. Capital Campaign Strategies That Work. Yes, Capital Campaign Strategies That Work that is now in its fourth edition. It sells so well over so many decades that they, they made her write it again two years, about two years ago. Um, so anyways, I just um, look her up if you have any doubts. She has many, many fundraising books published, all on raising big gifts and capital campaigns. So, um, and Kristen is writing in, I have the book and it's incredible. So do you have the fourth edition, Kristen? <laughs> um, so anyways, let's go ahead and get started. Um, Andrea, why don't you talk about how to help organizations think big and into the future. Um, how should they be planning for what's next? So thank you. Thank you, Amy, for inviting me to join this group. I love watching the chat. I have trouble pulling myself away from it. I, I never get tired of the fact that we hear from people from all over the world on these. It just There's something thrilling about it. And so thank you all for, for being here. For those of you who have the fourth edition of my book, that's great. Um, it has stood the test of time, though every time I look at it, I looked up something in it the other day and I thought to myself, why did I write it like that? So, <laughs> but I'm not going to do another edition. Anyway, here, here's a thought for you all. You know, there is no question that this um, crisis that we're in, this, this COVID-19 crisis, this worldwide crisis, is um, is devastating and challenging and heartrending for so many people. Not only people who have lost loved ones and are, are going to lose loved ones, but people who have lost jobs, people who, who have to stay inside, people who don't have enough to eat, people whose difficult lives were already difficult and now are going to be more difficult. Right, I mean, there's no question of the horror of what we are encountering and that it is not gonna go away cleanly anytime soon, right? We are not gonna, we're not gonna wake up tomorrow and it will magically have vanished into the skies somehow. So we have a long, we have a long road to, to tra tread here, to go down. And most organizations, I think, uh, find that when they start thinking about it, they will probably have to change the way they do business going forward. That they and we and the world is not going to get to the other side of this and find that it is exactly the same as it was when we started living inside and shutting our doors and, and being isolated. Um, and that, uh, that that provides remarkable opportunities for fundraising. I mean, some of the kinds of opportunities for fundraising we have not seen for a very long time. Now, you might be thinking, uh, what opportunities for fundraising? The market is a mess, and people who have money have all lost their money, and nobody has money, and everyone's nervous, and who's going to give? Well, I mean, certainly some people are nervous, and some people are worried about the market. That certainly is the case. But it is also the case that, number one, not everyone is losing money. In fact, there are a fair number of people who are making significant amounts of money. And to, to sort of put a laughing piece on that, you know, one of the kinds of people who are making money are like a friend of mine whose family owns a distillery in um, Mammoth Lakes, California. As my friend says, they are doing a robust business and pretty much anyone in the distillery or the booze business is doing pretty well. Now, I wonder if the people who do at-home AA counseling are also going to be doing pretty well, but it's just to show you. They that are, Andrea. <laughs> in fact, uh, I'm sure there's somebody on here from a drug and recovery addiction <laughs> type of program. Let us know what percentage your calls are up. Oh, I've heard going up, right. I a lot. Yeah. But just to give you another example, and I just put these out there, they are one of many, many, many. They, if you had stock in the, what is it, Peloton? Is that what it's called? Bad home bicycle? Yeah. You had stock in the Peloton business, you, your stock would be going, doing very well. And there's just a couple of, just a couple of examples, right? That, 
that every time there's a downturn or a problem, somebody is making money from it. And the people who are very wealthy, who can move their money around in a strategic and smart way are simply making money on the market these days. So don't decide because you're feeling like you're poor or not making money, that that's true across the board. In the donor class, there are a fair number of people who are a fair number, a lot of people who are actually doing very well. So people do have money. People in the donor class have money. That's number one to pay attention to. Number two to pay attention to, and this is really the big point that I wanna make and we can work from this, is that the very best way and best time to engage people, to engage board members and major donors, is when you have a real problem that you are trying to solve. Now let me say that again. When you have a real problem that you are trying to solve, it is a fantastic time to be reaching out to people whose advice you can seek and who may eventually be able to help you solve the problem with the answers that they may have helped you come up with. That once you have a plan that is firmly in place and solid and all cast in stone in a beautiful brochure or a piece that you're gonna be sending out to them, then all you're doing is asking your donors for money. That's all. And honestly, the best fundraising is never about asking people for money. Right? It's only about asking people to invest in making something different and making something change. So let me circle back and sort of bring my little rant here to a close. The, because most every organization is having to rethink the way they are going to have to be doing business, and because pretty much all of you have a chance to rethink the way you're doing business so that you can be doing it better at the end of this and not worse, you probably have the best time in a whole bunch of decades to, to really go out and talk to your major donors about how you should be thinking through what you are going to be when you come out of this and how you're going to be solving, solving problems. Let me just, just highlight my yesterday's aha, because I shared it with a friend of mine in the music world today. I went down to Union Square. I live here in New York. My husband and I went to Union Square. We just I just tested positive for antibodies for this disease, so I'm feeling fairly safe. So I went down to Union Square, and there in Union Square were three or four musicians who were socially distanced and who were playing, a flutist and a drummer and a keyboardist, and they were playing. And the whole vibe of the people who were walking by themselves in Union Square was different because they existed. Now, honestly, if you're a performing arts organization, it's hard to imagine having your auditorium open up with a person sitting every sixth seat. It just is troubling to imagine that. But imagining people and musicians and performers in every public space around your community, sponsored by you, in these times when people have to social distance and are feeling so anxious, now that's an idea with legs, right? So, okay. Yeah. All right, so let me let me highlight and point to some of the, the important points and the chat that's happening in this chat box. So one is, of course, there's a ton of, of chat going on about suicide prevention and mental health crisis looming large and all the issues that have come more addiction and relapse to come out of COVID. What that's doing, wow, that's very troubling on so many levels what it's doing is that it is strengthening your case for support like you never have before. I mean, that's what Andrea is talking about in terms of, you know, um, we now have an opportunity to fundraise like potentially we haven't done in years because this, the case for support strength um, of your of many many organizations in fact just got a lot stronger the need for services is stronger than ever across so so much in our sector and you know that's not a good thing in general but um, it will help you with fundraising so the other thing I want to point to which you may not have paid attention to if you're not in a capital campaign or haven't done a capital campaign but Andrea taught me that 
you know, many, many organizations make the mistake very early on in a capital campaign of making a four color, glossy, highly produced brochure of their case for support to trot out to donors. When you do that, they, it looks like the program and the project is done. There's nothing, there's no feedback to give. You're not going to them for ideas or feedback or discussion. You're just going for money because the plans are all laid out. And so I want you to really, really take that to heart for this too. You can go with to donors. You should be going to donors with ideas and plans that aren't quite fully cooked or definite so that you can have a meaningful and thoughtful discussion about how your organization will move into 2021, 2022 and beyond. Um, and that's really what the point was about. And you know whether or not you're in a campaign is irrelevant. Um, it's really about how you're thinking through um, moving your organization ahead with with your donors as partners, not just as checkbooks. Um, Andrea, do you want to say any more before I go to a couple of questions? And there is a campaign question here I want to address also, but I just want to sort of say that while this is a strategy, right, to to involve your donors in helping make decisions right before things are finalized. You have to be careful that it's not just manipulative, right? You have to really be willing to pull people together and to ask them for their opinions and to listen to what they say. That doesn't mean you need to do everything they say, but you need to be, to be in a place where, where you really are able to listen. Um, people often worry that, that a donor is going to have too big a say and will want you to do something you don't want to do. And the way to handle that is to, is to let people know that they are only one person among several or groups of people that you're talking to. And you're listening to everyone and will then come to a decision. So to ask only your largest donor for what they think is dangerous. To ask a bunch of your significant donors for their advice is less dangerous. Mm. Good. All right, so uh, let's start with Susan's question in the question box that says, I'm wondering if there's a best practice for getting board members to make specific pledge for the year. Is it the same as working with donors or is there something different other than um, not having to build a relationship? I assume that means she has a relationship with her board members. So how are you approaching um, donors. And the beginning, I should have read it, was I sent an email. Um, and my guess is, Andrea, that you're going to tell her that she shouldn't be just sending a solicitation by email to her board members. So go ahead. Okay. So there are several things that that, that you can do trying to get board oh. members to make that. Uh oh, I think Susan's correcting me. No, maybe she sent an email to me. I don't know. Uh, go ahead. How do you approach your board members? Well, I'm not quite do. sure. Here's yeah. what you don't do. What you really don't do is to go into a board meeting and say, it's time for you all to make your contributions and you will find the pledge form in your board packet. You don't want to do that, right? That's a really bad idea. <laughs> Right. It will. It is almost the only thing that you can do that would be worse than that is not to ask them at all. Right. So let's take that one off the table. That is not a good thing to do. There are a bunch of things you should know about asking board members. First of all, you should have a policy and every board member who comes on should know that they will be asked to make a meaningful contribution to your organization, to the annual fund and to special campaigns every year. And if you haven't talked to your board members when they've come on about that, then you have some homework to do to get board members to work with your government governance committee to make that standard and accepted practice. So that's that's governance piece. Once you have a governance piece, then you need a particular time in which you will be approaching board members. And my my strong preference is that you get either the head of the governance committee or your board chair or maybe you have a nominating committee or whoever, whatever, there sh should be one or two or three board members who actually go and talk to every board member about their gift every year. What that does is that it not only will amount, will lead to pretty good board participation, 
but it also gives them a chance to talk to board members about how they're feeling about being on the board, what questions they might have, what else they would like to do, what concerns or excitement they might have. Right, every year there should be a meeting one-on-one -on -one with every board member from one of your leaders. And that, to my mind, is, is without a doubt the best way to solicit, to solicit board giving. It takes some doing, but you'll find that when it happens, it really works. Amy, do you advise that? Amy, yes. We've talked about yes. this before, so. Yes, I, <laughs> I think you're, you're right on, right? We need to be talking to our board members in a one-on-one -on -one personal way, at least annually. Um, ideally, you know, a board member to a board member. The board chair or the development committee chair goes out and do, does this maybe with your executive director, but you absolutely positively. Um, as Andrea said, you can't do it in a group setting um, or, or in a non-personal way. All right, so Cynthia is asking in the chat, Andrea, and we, we won't be capital campaign focused too much, but we'll answer you know one or two capital campaign specific questions. Cynthia is asking, what do you do when you have a capital campaign for a building addition and your donor wants to use his company's uh, equipment to build it? Uh, yeah, and th this happens more often than you might imagine, right? It, it's not, not so uncommon. And you have to have a conversation with that donor saying, you know, you so appreciate, appreciate that, that you really need to separate his, his two roles, right? One as, as the part of the, of the building process in which case he has to follow the standard protocol. And if he would like to, you know, that, that he, you can use his equipment and then he can turn around and make a, a, give a, a contribution in kind, but that that would be separate, right, from other gifts that he might make to the campaign. And you, you have to be clear and upfront about it because he, you will be in a, he will be in a, a conflict of interest situation if you don't do that. But I would have that conversation up front. It doesn't mean that he can't use his industrial equipment to build the building, but if he's going to do that, he needs to bid and he needs to get the contract. And then if he wants to contribute some part of that back to your project, all the more power to him. Um, so I was partly reading questions and partly um, listening. David's asking, Isn't a con is it a conflict of interest if a board member benefits monetarily from the organization? So did you say that he could submit a bid? I wasn't yeah. paying attention. Yeah, yeah. He, needs yeah. To submit, he, he needs to act like any other contractor, right? It's a conflict of interest if, if the contract just gets you know, shifted over to him. But, well, and some organizations take a stronger position and during that time have a board member step down so that there is absolutely no conflict of interest. Yeah. Uh, organizations handle that in different ways, but it's something you do have to be careful about and you do have to have right straight up conversations with, with that Good. donor out. Yeah, this is interesting. Um, Risa is asking, do you think bringing four to six donors together in a small Zoom group to ask their opinions would work? What do you think Absolutely. of that, Andrea? Absolutely. Yes, I think it's, you know, I think in some ways we're in this wonderful time. People are at home. People want to be engaged. They want to be part of something. Somebody talked about physical distancing as opposed to social distancing. I think that's exactly right. We are physical distancing and it gives us a hunger for social closeness and for involvement. So I think it's, you could do a half dozen meetings like that if you wanted to, right? To discuss particular, particular issues that you, know, that, you're, that you are wrestling with and getting people's opinions. I think it's a wonderful idea. Uh, be sure that you, that you think about, you, know, you, you should pay close attention to how you facilitate meetings on Zoom. If, you, if you're not, you're probably experienced by now, but. Those of us who do that a lot learn that you have to facilitate with a somewhat strong hand. You have to be calling on people to get their, their input on Zoom because people don't know when to speak or when not to. Yeah, let's go into that a little bit more, Andrea. I think that's so important for organizations that are calling together groups of people, whether it's your board or a committee or a campaign committee or groups of donors um, or you know, community leaders, whatever it is you're calling together, you do want to have some Zoom protocol and really have 
uh, think about your agenda and the facilitation of the meeting. You want to include as many people as possible in the conversation. And Andrea does a beautiful job of calling on people and letting them know we'll be going around asking for everybody's opinion. That way people don't get lost reading their email. They know they're going to be called on. Um, and so, you know, maybe twice, depending on how many people are in the meeting, of course, but anything under 12, maybe, maybe even as many as 15, you can, you know, ask for a short sentence, you know, what, what are your thoughts? Give us your, your ideas quickly. Um, and you can tell them in one minute or less, share how you're feeling about this. Andrea, you're good at this. What else would you add? You know, I, over the last few months, I've done a lot of it. Um, and I, what I find is, is first of all, that I've gotten better at it, that it takes like anything else, it takes practice. It takes practice to sort of be able to feel the group in a Zoom meeting and to, and to be attentive. What, what I do often, even though people's names are on the, you know, on the screen, I often have a pad beside me and I make a list of names so I can make little notes about who said what and who I want to get back to. And if somebody has a question, I actually am keeping a side sheet to remind myself that somebody or rather talked about something. And then I'll just circle back and call on them. I often call on people uh, and I do it, uh, I might say, um, Joe, I'm, uh, tell me what you think about such and such. And Amy, I'm going to call on you next. <laughs> so I, I sometimes give people warning, right, that I'm going to call on them so they can pay attention. I'm sort of saving them if they have been on their email and only listening. Mm. That gets them listening because they know I'm going to call on them next. Right? right. The The other thing that I like to do in a live and on a Zoom meeting with like I said, less than 12 or 15 people, is I tell people at the end, we're gonna go around quickly and I'm gonna ask you for your key takeaway from this meeting or what the next steps are. So what your action item is, what your key takeaway was, what the mo most meaningful thing you heard was, you know, anything so that everybody gets a chance to participate. All right, so um, Holly's asking quickly, do you let everyone know who's on the Zoom call beforehand? Ah. Uh. You know, I, 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 I probably would send out an email saying, you know, here, here, here are the people that who are, going, who are going to join you, particularly if it's a great group, right? I mean, I might, I might send out a roster in advance or, uh, you know, people want to know who they're going to be serving with. Yeah, so you can send out an agenda yeah. and who's participating. And who's there. So yeah. I think that's by and large a good idea. It's not always necessary, but it's by and large a good idea. Yeah. So, Holly, I want to ask answer Holly's question here. Do you see this one? Yeah. Any, um, yeah. So we have a lot of first-time donors in response to our relief fund. I, she's from the United Way and now looking for a, an annual giving outside of the work of workplace giving. Um, she thinks that this is a good time to really go after go for a monthly giving program since this crisis will and does impact people um, they already serve. Is that crazy? Uh, we'll tie it back to our mission. First, I have one thing to say, and then I'm going to pass it back to Amy about monthly giving. I know nothing about monthly giving, but <laughs> but what I do know is this: that that I think it's a good idea to be asking people for annual giving outside of the workplace. But I would never frame it that way. I would never frame an annual giving letter as "give to our annual giving program." I got a, I don't have it anymore. I got a a, a solicitation the other day that said, give to our big, the, the, it, it showed beautiful pictures of what this organization does. And then the big panel was give to our annual giving. I thought to myself, I don't want ever to give to anybody's annual giving. I want to give to the difference they make in the world. I mean, they just blew it. So be careful that you don't ask people to give to your annual giving, even though that's what it's counting towards. Right? People are never giving to your annual giving. They're, they're giving to what makes it, what, what difference you're making in this world. And that's the way you need to frame your, your solicitations. Yes. So if you're even considering having a capital campaign because it's your 50th anniversary, nobody, right. no donor gives a hoot that it's your 50th anniversary. I mean, it's nice to say you have a track record, but 
what are you going to be doing for the next 5, 10, and 50 years? That's what makes a difference in a capital campaign. So, so don't come tell us that you want to do a capital campaign in honor of your 50th anniversary unless you have a plan for how the next 5 to 10 years are going to look. Um, all right. So uh, here, Lawrence has had this nasty question. <laughs> it's not nasty because it's a nasty question. It's nasty because of what it says about your organization. What to do when you're not allowed to talk to board members? I assume, Lawrence, that you're a development director or something like that. Um, that, of course, is a, is a, so there are two answers to that, I think. One is that if only your executive director is able to talk to board members, then you need to be sure you educate your executive director so that he or she knows what to do. Right, then your job is not to work with the board. Your job is to be sure that the people who can talk to the board know how to do that best. So that's one way to thread that needle. And the other way to thread that needle is to begin having conversations about what your role as development director should be with regard to the board. That's a, a governance question that you should begin to raise if your executive director isn't able to do a, to do a good job. Yeah, so what I would add to that, I have pretty strong feelings about this too. If you are at a small, smaller organization where you are the development director and the only fundraiser on staff and you are not allowed to talk to the board, I think that is a huge red flag that there is no trust between the executive director. The executive director doesn't trust you. Uh, to me, to me, there could be many other things going on in the background, but it's something that worries me. If it's a really large organization, they can't have every develop, you know, and there's a development team of 10 or 20 or 30 people on the development staff. It's true. Not every development staff member can interact with the board. That's overwhelming and inundating. But the top development person at any shop should be not only having interactions with the board, but that should be a key part of their role to interact with the board. So I would, I you know, without going too far, I do wonder what's going on when a development staff member isn't allowed to have interaction with the board. I think it's a key part of their job. All right, um, Andrea, tell me uh, what your next which is there a question that's jumping out to you or should i ask you one oh, i do want to say hi to abby von schlegel i see she's <laughs> adding some wonderful wisdom to this group i'm just looking, looking excellent here. um nice to all right see you here, abby uh yeah there's so much good chat in the in the chat box some of it we can't even follow it it goes by so quickly but um oh uh, Oh, Larry, I see it's your board's policy. Your ED does not like it either. You know, the two of you then need to work on changing it, right? It, it's, um, you know, maybe, maybe there is a, an enlightened board member on the board who sits on the board of other organizations where they've had interactions with the development staff and understand what the role is. And maybe that board member could speak up on your behalf. Um, all right. So Alicia is asking, um, well, I guess this is a specific question. I'm going to broaden it a little. She says, what do you recommend when the board chair is the director for another nonprofit? And I think that this isn't as uncommon as you think. Maybe not the board chair, but that, that executive directors um, are serve on other nonprofit boards and then the question is where is their allegiance um, and any thoughts on that uh, you know uh, many people wear wear multiple hats we all wear multiple hats all the time mm -hmm. right the I mean in our personal lives and our professional lives we, we wear multiple hats I think it needs to be very clear that um, uh, that that the where that person's uh, alliances are, where their loyalties are in what sorts of cir circumstance. So I think there's nothing particularly wrong with it, but I think it needs to be talked about, mm -hmm. right? And one of my, my actually first mentor in this business became the president of a college where the, on the board of the college was something like 68 people were on his board when he took over the leadership of the board. And every one of them was the was the pastor or the head of a church. It was the United Methodists that were some kind of a religious 
college and, and every one of them came with two hats and their primary loyalty was to their church and not to the college of which they were on the board. And he made a policy that that couldn't be the case, that you could not serve if, you know, if it was going to, that you could have one or two people like that, but you can't have everybody like that. So, so I think to bring it up and have a discussion about it, I think is a really important, important thing. Um, most of the time, problems like that are worth discussing. And what happens is that people are afraid of them, so they don't discuss them. I, I think, I think the, you can wrestle with it. In, if, if a director of another organization is undermining your organization and sending gifts back to their organization, that's clearly a problem. <laughs> so, so you need to get clear about it. So... Andrea, I think Judy is asking an interesting question. We started our conversation about visioning so or and planning for the future. And I, I think this is what she's getting at. So I'm going to point us to Judy's question. And can you talk about the future and coming out stronger? Uh, systems, inclusiveness, nimbleness. Thank you. Yeah, we got totally waylaid from issues of visioning, didn't we? Yeah. So thank you for your for your question, Judy. Um, you know, I think there there are uh, there are many things to look at. One that I think for for many of us is this um, chasm that is showing up in the society, right? Of the haves and the have-nots, right? People who live financially so close to the edge with no savings and no nothing who are devastated by this. And people who have been accumulating wealth for years who are sitting back and baking sourdough bread or whatever lovely thing they happen to want to be doing. And I think that chasm between the haves and the have-nots is something that for some organizations is a wonderful opportunity to actually sit and talk about. And of course, it depends on the mission of your organization, perhaps. But many organizations can turn things to actually address how look at how their organization might address those problems, right? Which are so stark in our society at the moment. So that's it's sort of on the big on a big topic. On a more close to home topic, there are many organizations that are going to have to change the way they do business. For example, one I heard about yesterday, the Museum of Natural History here in New York is a huge institution, and. Uh, it has uh, something like 1,800 volunteers who function as docents. Now, I may not have that number quite right, but it's more than 1,000. And most of those people are over 65. Now, that raises a whole lot of questions going forward if COVID-19 is going to be in the air and they are going to be having children come into the museum. And the question is, how do we reshape the way we do business so that we no longer that because we can't put people so many people at da in danger right that's not going to change anytime soon that's a big question that points not just to a simple issue of spacing but really how the museum is going to do its business how it is going to how it is going to work with people what it's what it's how it's going to carry out its mission going forward I thought about that but it took my breath away Mm. right when I heard about it. As I said at the top of the hour, this question of how performing arts organizations are going to function in the society is really up for grabs. I mean, that's to me a fascinating and difficult question that is worth looking in, at all kinds of things they might be doing that are not the same things that they have been doing, right? It just, I mean, a theater can't, can't survive selling one out of every six sick tickets. And financially, they can't survive that way. I and mean, besides for the fact that it would feel bizarre, right? It's gonna go way beyond theaters, Andrea. Community centers, yes, that's right. that's gathering right. places, that's right. you know, religious organizations, yes. any place that people gather in large numbers are that's going right. to have to. So, I mean, performing it's, arts centers are a good example, but I think that it's- just happen to be close to my heart. I, I, I know, <laughs> but I wanted to just widen it for a minute because, right. you know, the idea, uh, you know, on my mind is camp this summer because I've got two kids, one that was going to work at a camp and one that was hoping to go to a camp. Um, but, you know, community centers, camps, religious institutions, all of these organizations are really going to have to rethink the model of how they provide these services. 
Yeah, and, and um, how are there ways in which, I mean, rather than thinking about, about the problem from the negative, right? Is there a way that you can think about it from the positive, right? Is there a way that you can imagine that you would be doing your business in a way that actually ends up being better than rather than worse than what, what it is you've been doing. Now, I'm going to stick to my music thing uh, again. Forgive me, but I, it's, it's just when I, I developed some thoughts about it, speaking with someone this morning. Those people who are in the classical music world or the music world in general know that there is a problem when passive audiences sit in theaters and watch performances, right, that are, that sort of aren't interactive, right? They, somebody's playing a Mozart concerto or whatever, it's fine and dandy and lovely, but the people in the audience are all white haired and, uh, you know, and it's essentially a passive activity. Isn't there a way to take this crisis and say, let's really look at what the power of music is and isn't there a better way that we can be working with people around that? And I think if somebody noodled that long enough, you'd come up with some pretty interesting things. All right, Andrea, every week we take a seventh inning stretch. We, uh, so everybody, uh, we haven't done a physical stretch. It's sort of more of a mental stretch, but if you wanna take a physical stretch, we will. And I'm gonna tell you some of the most exciting news that I've had all week. And that is that next week on our town hall call with uh, the one that Andrea and I do, for the Capital Campaign Toolkit, we are gonna have a very special guest and that is Seth Godin. And in case you don't know about Seth Godin, uh, quick Google will tell you exactly who he is. Um, but Seth is gonna talk about nonprofits, resilience, and the chance to reset our strategy. So uh, make sure that you will mark your calendar for Monday at two o'clock. I'm gonna put in the chat box right now, Monday, two o'clock Eastern time. Andrea and I are both in New York and New Jersey. Not this coming Monday. Oh, not this okay, coming Monday. Monday. It's Thank Memorial you. Day, June 1st. Thank you, Andrea. Not this coming Monday. Um, Capital Campaign, C-A-M. Hold on, I'm putting it in the chat, P-M-P-A-I-G-N, toolkit.com slash town hall. That's, uh, did I spell it right? I did not, I spelled town hall wrong. Okay, hold on, capital, uh, so don't click that link. It's gonna get you to a dead <laughs> link. Um, it will be recorded, but capital campaign toolkit.com slash town all. Okay, that time I think I spelled it right. Um, you need to register for that if you're not already on our Monday calls at um, two o'clock. So right, it's not this Monday. This Monday is Memorial Day and we're taking the day off. Actually, uh, we haven't taken a day off in, in a few months. So we're going to take Monday off from doing our town halls. But the I know I need shorter URLs. Um, so the following Monday is June 1st, and we are also gonna have a giveaway for um, a wonderful book, um, really thinking about how to think big in the nonprofit sector as well, in addition to Seth being there to lead the conversation. So, all right, that's our seventh inning stretch. And, um, so Amy, did I tell you my, my, my talking about seventh inning stretch, I tell you my, the, the joke of this whole thing that I like this, I haven't told your group, which is that in the reason Dennis the Menace, he said, can't, can we go out to, I'm, we, can't we go out to dinner? I'm tired of eating groceries. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to. Now, whenever my husband says, what's for dinner? I say groceries. <laughs> exactly. I don't want to eat any more groceries uh, either. Okay. So Lori, let's, uh, Lori's asking about board fundraising training. She says, I've seen the great topic ideas Amy showed in a video. Um, we've had a readiness assessment report say that our board wants more training on that. So good news, Andrea and I both provide virtual and live and in person when we can. But right now we have lots of virtual uh, training opportunities for board members. We can, we have videos, we can do it live, um, a board retreat. So I'll just leave it at that. Contact us if you want to do some board training. We would love to help with that. Um, 
Michelle Russell has asked, uh, they had to con cancel their <laughs> annual event to go virtual. Uh, what are the benefits of small, 30, 30 small intimate events or one large virtual community-wide event? Amy, I'm interested in your thoughts, but I would say both and. Mm. Yeah, I think that sounds right. Um, we do different things. They accomplish different things. Yes, right. yes, they do. I mean, one of the things that I've mentioned, uh, one example, and there's so many these days of events that are going virtual that are successful, um, is a, a 5K that happens every spring in my town. And obviously there's all sorts of expenses that go into a 5K and you have to worry about weather and rain and all this other stuff. Well, this year they didn't have to have any of those expenses with paying police or putting up barriers or worrying about rain. They got t-shirts super early. They sent them to all registrants and participants and asked them to wear them and post pictures. There was a big social buzz my guess is that they raised tons of money compared to what they've raised on their, in their 5K because they did their virtual event so beautifully. In addition to being creative with your big social event and having it go uh, on social and live and vir uh, not live, virtual, et cetera, um, uh, you should be having small intimate events. Um, one, I don't think one has anything to do with the other, both and. And Doug says that uh, they just raised 400,000 through their online art auction. Go Doug, yes. Um, all right. Alicia Good. wants to know who would be the best to make peer-to-peer -peer asks. Uh, and that, you know, that depends on, first of all, who is willing, who would do it well, mm. and who is respected by the group. Right. So it can be a board chair, it can be a governance committee chair, it can just be a board member if they're positioned properly, right? There's no one answer to that. Um, but, but you just have to look at the reality of your situation. And sometimes you can get two or three people to divide the group up, right? So not everybody's having to do, having to do all, of, all of them. If that's the case, you need to plan it so they're all doing it in roughly the same way. You need to plan it anyway, but you really need to plan it if you're more than one person doing it. Yeah. And just to go back to virtual events, because I see so much chat going on in the sidebar here, um, I'm really encouraging people at this point, instead of postponing your events to the fall, which I'm seeing a lot of organizations do, please do take them virtual. I do not think we will be gathering in large groups this fall or maybe even for a year. Um, and so I want you to have either a really strong plan B to go virtual, because I hate to see you plan it you know, you planned it in the spring, you postponed it to the fall, you're gonna plan it for the fall, it's gonna get canceled again. Um, and so I'd much rather you see, I'd much rather you take it virtual, do a lot of thought and planning into it to how you can get people excited, get people to share, get people to participate and engaged online, um, rather than putting all this time and money and effort into it and then have it, have it be canceled again, you know, either in advance or last minute. Um, all right, so um, you wanna look at Michelle's question about uh, long and short-term changes, long versus short-term changes. Some of these changes include reteaching how people operate, technology for older people, uh, when their comfort level is quite low. So, all right, I, a number of things come to my mind from this. First of all, technology is here to stay. And the, the incredibly increased facility with it that we have gotten over the last three months for old people and young people um, mean that it is the way we are going to do business. And to my mind, every time you can do business this way effectively, you should frees up your resources to do all sorts of other things. So this is not gonna go away anytime soon. There may be better technologies that come that you know Zoom may be replaced by or complemented by other things. We may get you know better innovations. I'm sure we will get better innovations, but people aren't gonna go back to the same way they were beforehand. They really aren't. All of a sudden they will have gotten comfortable. And as someone who is an elderly person, I, I wouldn't be too quick to assume that old people aren't comfortable with technology. If nothing else, they use a lot of it when they're, when they're talking to their grandchildren, 
right? And that's these days, grandkids are checking in with them all the time, right? Mm -hmm. That said, recently I was on a I was on a steering committee call with an elderly person who was using her cell phone, and she couldn't decide. She couldn't hear well enough, so she kept putting it up to her ear. It took me a while to realize that what we were seeing on the screen was the inside of her ear, <laughs> which was peculiarly intimate <laughs> and funny. <laughs> Right? Can you imagine her holding her cell phone that was on FaceTime or Zoom or whatever up to her ear so that she could hear better and all you could see was the down her ear canal? It was um, very sweet and funny. Yeah, but you know, I would say the vast majority, including my 75 year old parents, have learned quickly to Zoom and now are perfectly competent and comfortable at it because all of their you know, they take classes, they're in book clubs, everybody's meeting by Zoom. And unless they want to be totally isolated, they're getting on board with it. And, you know, just to just to emphasize it, it is fascinating to see because Andrea and I started the Capital Campaign Toolkit almost two years ago. And the whole idea is that all of our campaign support, help, guidance, advising is done virtually, remotely, and online. Um, because we see that as the way of the future. And so, and you know, we've been convening campaign committee meetings on Zoom for two years or more. And, uh, and because it's, it's efficient, it's effective, P volunteers like to participate, not just during COVID, but um, you know, there's something obviously to be said for in-person. We're all yearning to get back to that, of course. But in terms of effic efficiency and effectiveness, there is really something to be said for um, for being virtual. And that's... You know, I think, Amy, one of the things that's going to happen, actually, is that as people are comfortable and continue with virtual communications and virtual work, What's going to happen is that you can use the times that people actually do get together in person to be very special, right? They will gain a certain significance that they haven't had in the past. And you can, you will begin to get good at figuring out what should, what, what you should use when, right? So, mm -hmm. so I, I think there's actually a big opportunity in that to, to think that through and to try it out and to, to see how you can make, make the most of in person meetings and not just look at them the way you used to look at them. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I give you an interesting, uh, interesting little story about a, about a campaign steering committee I, wor I worked with virtually for, for a long time. And it came time, actually it was, it was a campaign planning committee, and it came time really to disband that committee. It was a group of nine or ten people. We had been meeting every other week for some several months. And when it came time to disband it, I said, you know, this really will be our last meeting because we've done our job. You know, people will be invited back into work in other ways. And the group as a whole stood up and said, no, we don't want to be disbanded. <laughs> they, they, there was something so effective about it and it was easy for them to be part of. And they felt like they were part of a group that had created, that had created a, real, a real collegial effectiveness, that it had been a great group. It was the only time I ever had a campaign steering committee that said we didn't want, don't want to disband. Thank you very much. You can go away, but we're not going to. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, okay, so Brian's asking about how to sign up for the Monday Capital Campaign Zoom calls. So I put it back in the in the chat. It's just capitalcampaigntoolkit.com slash town hall. And yes, we need a shorter URL for that for sure. Um, but that is what it is right now. So, all right, let's talk about final thoughts in terms of visioning, um, planning for the future. What are, your, what are your final thoughts, Andrea, on how people should be working with their board members, working with their donors, and really thinking about how they're going to provide services and stay relevant um, post COVID-19? That's a big question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess let, let me just uh, answer it this way, that, that for the most part, the answers to things, the right answers to things are buried in the questions and your willingness to ask those questions. Um, that 
that you can't just put out to a group of people who don't know anything, tell us what to do, that won't work. But if you do your homework and come up with, with some alt alternate models that you can then explain to people and get their reaction to your alternate models, what you'll find is that people will give, be able to give you to give you good advice, right? That, that it doesn't work just to say, tell me what to do to people who aren't positioned or qualified to do that. So your job as leaders, whether you're development leaders, executive directors, board members, your job as leaders is to do enough of the work so that you can frame the questions in a way that you can put them out to other people so that it will feel meaningful and that they really will be able to contribute something from their own ideas about that. And if you have, the, if you have faith in people's goodwill and people's willingness to think with you, about challenging issues and you do your homework in in thinking them through just enough so that you know what the issues are you will be well rewarded um, by hosting those conversations and doing it them long enough until the answers present themselves um, and and they eventually do sometimes quickly sometimes not quickly but, but thinking through the future, the future of your organization and the future of how you carry out your mission is a big and important opportunity. And you shouldn't miss it by making quick snap decisions at the executive level without, without reaching out and bringing in some of the best thinkers and stakeholders and partners and decision makers. Yeah. I think I think, oh, sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. I was just going to say that you and I always go back and forth on this. I always push for a longer time and you always push for quicker resolutions. And that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful tension, right? And I think I was about to do that. So <laughs> I was about to do that. So I was going to say, um, you know, you want also, in addition to your visioning conversation and your strategic planning conversation, have an A and a B plan almost and think through, it's an opportunity to think through with donors and supporters, what happens if we do get this funding and what happens if we don't get this funding? And they will probably step up and help you figure out a way to find the funding. So if you put, you know, you put the options, the plans, the, the decisions to be made in front of people in a thoughtful and strategic way, they will be more likely to be partners. Um, and it will spark ideas in them. They'll say, oh, I didn't know you needed that. And only, you know, $100,000 and you could do all that? Well, gosh, put me down for it. Sign me up, right? Um, if it was only that simple. But sometimes it is. Sometimes, sometimes it is. It is. Exactly right. All right. So All right, guys. And Amy, yeah. I just see this uh, from India. Our friend in India has said that they suffered a huge cyclone yesterday um, and on top of COVID. And I just want to say I, uh, you should be raising money, of course. You should, you should be raising money. In my opinion, the best way to raise money is to go to the largest donors first. That is truly a capital campaign strategy. And of course, you will want to go broad as well. But my heart goes out to you. Um, this is one huge tragedy on top of another. And I just didn't want that to sit out there without at least saying that we're reading it and our hearts are breaking with you. Yeah, good. Thank you, Andrea. All right, thank you for being here. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. We're here for you. So, you know, if we didn't get to your question or you have any thoughts you want to share for, with us, please do feel free uh, to email us. Uh, you can reach me as always at amy at amyeisenstein.com or, of course, me or Andrea at amy at capitalcampaigntoolkit.com or Andrea at capitalcampaigntoolkit.com. Dot com. All right, guys, have a great week. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody.